Donkey Kong, and Super Mario Brothers. And now, the ultimate retro nostalgia throwback game. I present to the world, Alex Jones's New World Order Wars. They're turning the friggin' frogs game. I'll eat your ass, you Nazi scum. Let's free the Patriots. First came Pac-Man, Donkey Let's free the Patriots and defeat the globalist tech team. We are going to defeat the globalists very bigly. This game is mostly peaceful. Woo! Ah! I'm going to lower the world's population. <laughs> oh, big deal. I'm taking you down, rapist. I did not have sexual relations with that saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> Download it now at alexjonesgame.com because as we all know, anything badass gets censored. Holy shit. Holy shit, dude. Wow. Okay, not what I not what I expected necessarily. Hi everybody, welcome back to the stream. Uh, what do we have for tonight? Um, this <laughs> this took me by surprise, to be honest. Uh, wow, the frogs and they burst into the little rainbow things. George Soros as a dragon here. I think this is Zuckerberg with the Thought Police hammer. The band hammer, I guess that's called. What are the rainbow bats? Oh, the coronavirus bats! Is that what they're from? And then the doctors with the needles trying to inject you with the vaccine. Holy crap. Okay. Um, the Bill Gates thing did make me laugh. This is actually pretty funny. I thought about... Oh, my God. Look at what they put his name as. I didn't even catch that. Holy crap. Um, I, I would like to play the game at some point. You have to pay for it, though. I feel kind of like... Uh, I, I don't necessarily want to pay for the game. If there was like a thing I could do in a browser, I might mess around with it. But... I just, I just don't feel like spending 20 bucks on the Alex Jones video game, to be honest. Uh, let's look at tonight's schedule. We've got, uh, we're going to resume reading the Techno Optimist Manifesto from uh, Mark Andreessen of Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, we have a few videos from YouTube. What I want to leave time for is the Vincent Bevins talk on Novara Media, which we started on the last stream and we unfortunately did not be, we were not able to finish for time. It's a rather long, like a hour and a half episode. So we're a decent chunk into that and I want to start that around 9 p.m. So we have about an hour to move through all the different content. Um, I think let's do a bit of reading at the top of the stream and then uh, potentially we will get into this left YouTube pipeline video this is on the longer side. It's like a 35 minute video, but it would be a worthwhile recap of all that territory. There's also this piece about the political ideology iceberg explained, um, which is like over an hour. It's an hour and a half. We'll have to spread that out through a few different streams actually, but maybe we'll sample some of that. Uh, we have a few more readings too, but I guess that's gonna frame our program for tonight. Let's read this Techno Optimist Manifesto. We'll get through some of the YouTube content time provided and then around nine o'clock we're going to start that vincent bevins talk uh at novara media the downstream podcast is the name of the program all right let's see where are we here um i think i'll show my screen like this that you can kind of roughly read along i will share the url if you have not come across this already uh we started reading it on the stream a little while ago this is from october 16th this is published by mark andreessen p marka i think is his handle on twitter he is a venture capitalist who's a partner at a16z andreessen horowitz as you may know them and they published this piece which is extremely twitter brained um, Colleen in the chat is asking about 5G and EMF. I was doing some research. I was doing a research dump in the hashtag esoteric channel in the Discord. And I, I gotta say, I mean, I'm working on a long form episode, so I don't want to spoil too much, but like, it has taken me a long time to warm up to this stuff. Uh, I've become internet brained myself, perhaps. But some of the stuff I was reading from Berkeley seems really credible. You know, it just seems like... The analogy they make is uh, our generation's big tobacco, the way that the FCC is lobbied by all these cell phone manufacturers. So it's uh, something 
worth looking into. This is going to get this channel demonetized and banned immediately. You know what? <laughs> live fast, live dangerous. Uh, we've, we've been uh, under the ban hammer the entire time. So we started reading this piece. We got through <laughs> lies, <laughs> truth, <laughs> technology. Uh, it's, it's been basically poetry so far. Um, and now we are at the section called markets. And I mean, you can even kind of see in the text here that it's all of these different like stanzas and it's um, they're kind of declarative statements. But Markets is going to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of what the political belief system is behind the Techno Optimist Manifesto or effective accelerationism or all of these other terms that are thrown around on the Internet. Let's dive in and we'll start our read. I'll give a bit of feedback as we go through this. Um, maybe the last thing to mention. The point of this project is to do a thoughtful read and not just relentlessly shitpost the whole way through. So if I withhold some of my commentary and I give a, a very generous interpretation, um, I'm trying to uh, respond to this in a meaningful sense and not just jump into a flame war or whatever. Okay, markets. We believe free markets are the most effective way to organize a technological economy willing buyer meets willing seller a price is stuck is excuse me struck both sides benefit from the exchange or it doesn't happen profits are the incentive for producing supply that fulfills demand prices encode information about supply and demand markets cause entrepreneurs to seek out high prices as a signal of opportunity to create new wealth by driving those prices down now the one stickler definition which I imagine they will address in the later parts of this, is that often people will mean, uh, when they say free markets, they will mean unregulated markets, uh, w markets without government interven intervention. Alternatively, among certain liberal circles, uh, free markets will mean the Adam Smith definition, which is a market that exists uh, without rent. So um, that is a, a factional dispute and a theoretical dispute amongst liberals, whether rent is a drain on the productive capacity of society, um, or if it's an effective way of distributing short-term resources and, and whatever. But um, okay, first thing to flag free markets, does it mean deregulation or does it mean uh, a society without rents? Continuing on, we believe the market economy is a discovery machine, a form of intelligence, an exploratory evolutionary adaptive system. Sounding very Hayekian. Here, oh, here we go. We believe Hayek's knowledge problem overwhelms any centralized economic system. Very a strange claim for someone who's building AI, right? Um, all actual information is on the edges in the hands of the people closest to the buyer. The center, abstracted away from both the buyer and the seller, knows nothing. Centralized planning is doomed to fail. The system of production and consumption is too complex. Decentralization harnesses complexity for the benefit of everyone. Centralization will starve you to death. <laughs> okay, so we got a little bit of flavor in here. Um, socialism, 100 billion dead. Okay, all right. Uh, a strong disagree in this one. We believe in market discipline. The natural, the market naturally disciplines. The seller either learns and changes when the buyer fails to show or exits the market. When market discipline is absent, there is no limit to how crazy things can get. The motto of every monopoly and cartel, every centralized institution not subject to market discipline, <laughs> monopoly and cartel, and say, well, that's okay. It's a, a few things lumped into that category. We don't care because we don't have to. Markets prevent monopolies and cartels. Well, this is what the ANCAPs would say, right? If you were a 14-year-old libertarian, um, one of your major talking points would be that, um, imagine for a moment, if you will, there's a conservative, uh, Fernie in the chat, 07, good to see you. Uh, sorry, I haven't been responding to people. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to uh, jump into this read at the top of the stream. Um, let's imagine for a moment there's a conservative and there's an anarcho-capitalist. And the conservative is going to say something like, uh, we have deregulated too much of the economy and thus now monopolies have formed and we need government to step in to uh, break them up or, or something like that. Um, it's hurting everyday people. I'm imagining a conservative populist or something like that. Uh, and the ANCAP is going to say that actually if government entirely stepped out, then 
uh, no monopoly would be able to form and actually government is required to prop up the monopoly. So in a perfect, you know, horizontal uh, open market competition, then they would outcompete the monopolies on those grounds. So I am reading this much more in the total deregulation and cap perspective. And I'm also going to do in that context, I think probably free markets is going to mean total deregulation and not the Smithian definition that I mentioned earlier. We believe markets lift people out of poverty. In fact, markets are by far the most effective way to lift vast numbers out of poverty and always have been. Uh, um, maybe. I don't, well, how about China? I guess China has markets too. I kind of think central planning lifts more people out of poverty. Uh, even, okay, he says next, even in totalitarian regimes, an incremental lifting of the repressive boot off the throat of the people and their ability to produce and trade leads to rapidly rising incomes and standards of living. Lift the, lift the boot a little bit more, even better. Take the boot off entirely. Who knows how rich everyone can get. Isn't the thing that like, has created the prosperity of China that it has such draconian authoritarian controls over... Like, capital flight is extremely prohibitive. It's very difficult to do. Um... What, what? Okay. All right. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. We believe markets are inherently individualistic, an inherently individualistic way to achieve superior collective outcomes. We believe markets do not require people to be perfect or even well intentioned, which is good because have you met people? <laughs> Adam Smith, we've got a quote here from Adam Smith. It is not the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we can, that, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we can expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but for their, but to their self-love, and never talk to them out of our own necessities, but of their advantages. David Friedman, this is the son of Milton Friedman. David Friedman is also the author of, um, is the title of the book just Anarcho-Capitalism, I think? I think that's just his... Uh, is there a Vitalik response to techno optimism? My techno optimism, November 27th. Oh shit, this is from literally today. Okay, last month. Oh, this is actually, this looks interesting. Who else is on? All right. Um, I am very interested to read that, but I want to get through this section first. David Friedman, I believe he is the author of the book just titled Anarcho Capitalism. <laughs> He points out that people only do things for other people for three reasons, love, money, or force. Love doesn't scale, so the economy can only run on money or force. The force experiment has been run and found wanting. Let's stick with money. We believe the ultimate moral defense of markets is that they divert people who otherwise would raise armies and start religions into peacefully productive pursuits. Huh. That's a big... Does anybody have a... Is that, is that tagging anything for somebody? Like, I think of the Friedman quote that markets, are, markets allow for coordination without coercion. I think of that quote. Is this a paraphrase of someone else? Because this is a pretty big statement uh, without a citation. Maybe I'm just missing the reference. We believe markets, to quote Nicholas Stern, are how we take care of people we don't know. We believe markets are the way to generate societal wealth for everything else we want to pay for, including basic research, social welfare programs, and national defense. Huh. Basic research, okay. Social welfare programs, interesting. And national defense, doubly interesting. That is not really jiving with the literal author of the anarcho-capitalist book mentioned like a paragraph earlier huh we believe there is no conflict between capitalist profits and a social wef welfare system that protects the vulnerable in fact they are aligned the production of markets creates the economic wealth that pays for everything else we want as a society you know um you will hear this actually from from people on the left who are uh, social democrats of creating a social safety net or uh, economic welfare system 
um, if you press them on it, it does actually require the conditions for capitalists to make profits. That is what supports uh, the welfare state. Um, obviously, that can be with, within various types of extremes where um, we could very easily have that now with the amount of profits being taken from American capitalists, but we don't. So um, the idea that you're going to generate a whole bunch of profits and then the social welfare system is going to magically pop into occurrence out of thin air, um, that's going to require class struggle to build those things. They don't just happen on their own. Uh, okay. We believe central economic planning elevates the worst of us and drags everyone down. Markets exploit the best of us to benefit all of us. Uh, I don't agree with that. I disagree. <laughs> we believe central planning is a doom loop. Markets are an upward spiral. I talk about this in an upcoming podcast with Benjamin Bratton, who's a philosopher of technology. And um, oh, Billy, Billy's in the chat. He's late. Um, sorry, let me start from the very beginning because Billy didn't show up on time or do his homework. So sorry, everyone else who's been watching. I'm just going to scroll all the way back here because uh, Billy showed up late. Um, what, what Benjamin Bratton says uh, is that we are already living in a planned economy, um, Google and Amazon create synthetic price on a daily basis. Uh, we have a conversation around uh, Ludwig von Mises, who is the author of um, Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth, is the uh, original text, the kind of intellectual argument that discredits socialist centralized planning um, in, in the 20th century. Uh, and then he also brings up Hayek and um, Hayek's book, The Sensory Order, which I think we'll probably do some work on uh, next semester. But I'm not, I'm just, I'm not really convinced about this. I mean, I think that probably the computational capacity, the limits to central planning in the 20th century was a question of computation. And markets were able to accumulate an enormous amount of information. Um, they're the sensing mechanism. And this is like, I'm really condensing the kind of Hayek uh, argument here. They're the, the sensing mechanism through which you can derive price, and then price leads to the efficient allocation of resources. Um, you get lumber to the east side of the country and steel to the west, and people can buy what they need. Otherwise, you end up with the you know Soviet Union situation where there's uh, all these the, there's only regular size nails and um, in the Soviet Union all of the the roofs of the farms were uh, unfinished because there was no economic incentive for the factories to produce tiny nails so what happens is that when the factories are given production quotas they will produce um, you know, 200,000 pounds of nails, right? And they'll do that at the medium average size nail, um, and then they'll fill up the entire production quota. But making smaller nails requires a lot more work. And because the quota is determined by the overall weight of the nails, um, they're not getting paid extra money for the additional labor that has to go into the small nails. Thus, you end up in these situations of what we call shortages, which is where all of the roofs for the farms in the Soviet Union couldn't nail their shingles down to the roof because there were no tiny nails in the entire country. Okay. I also, I also just this total aside, but like I always had a dream of making an artwork that was just a 200,000 pound nail, just one single nail that filled the entire quota for the, uh, for the Soviet Union. Um, that's another, that's another story. I think it would be a great public sculpture. Actually, it'd be a great public sculpture. The point of all of this is that, um, we now have the computational capacity to produce price without all of the same needs for market inputs. In fact, if we look at the work of Lee Phillips and we talk about the People's Republic of Walmart, um, the, the sensing mechanism of Amazon, ha there is more information collected by Amazon in the metadata of the products than there is contained in the price. Um, that now that sounds very abstract. So just practically, what that means is like you may look through a variety of different products, and then you find different recommendations. And although you were looking for, you know, a, a zip tie over here, you chose to get a, a a bread twist over there or something like that. And so all of that additional information is not crunched into the. I'm being very reductive here. It's not crunched into the additional 
uh, into the supply and demand signals that would otherwise shape the price in the market. Um, so those pathways of discovery, all of the kind of like uh, the placement and the attention dynamics of browsing the platforms that finally incentivize someone to purchase it, thus the seller captures the value of the commodity in the market and so on. Um, none of that is really included in the, the price as we have conventionally understood it. So the computational power and the metadata attached to all of these things on big platforms within um, big uh, economies within these massive platforms, that just changes some of these 20th century assumptions. So, okay, I've gone on way too long with this, but um, I don't think that central planning is a doom loop. I think that planning is actually necessary. Um, and there is, in you know, obviously the 21st century crisis of climate change, there is there's no market for uh, for uh, planning the climate. You know that is an international uh, cord something that has to be coordinated on an international scale and uh, requires significant investment outside of the scope of the private sector, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. Listen to the podcast that's coming out on Thursday. The economist William Nordhaus has shown that creators of technology are only able to capture about 2% of the economic value created by that technology. The other 98% flows through to the society in the form of what economists call the social surplus. Technological innovation in a market system is inherently philanthropic by a 50 to 1 ratio. Who gets more value from a new technology? The single company that makes it or the millions or billions of people who use it to improve their lives? Uh, Ricardo here. Um, we're, going, we're going way, way back. So um, capital um, in, what, 1863? Um, when is capital? It's 1863, right? Uh, There's it, it a response to David Ricardo and um, Adam Smith. So we're talking about kind of the fundamental theoretical foundations of liberalism as a political ideology. Uh, he writes, we believe in David Ricardo's concept of comparative advantage as distinct from competitive advantage. Comparative advantage holds that, that even someone who is best in the world at doing everything will buy most things from other people due to opportunity cost. Comparative advantage advantage in the context of a properly free market guarantees high employment regardless of the level of technology. We believe a market sets wages as a function of the marginal productivity of the worker. Mm. Therefore, technology which raises productivity drives wages up, not down. This is perhaps the most counterintuitive idea in all of economics, but it's true, and we have 300 years of history that prove it. So this is, this is the big one here. Um, full, uh, full confession, okay, we're towards the end of it. This is the piece that uh, I skimmed this before the stream, and that was the thing that's, that stuck out to me. The market sets wages as a function of the marginal productivity of the worker. There was a theory in, oh my God, what was I? I, I <laughs> I'm trying to remember all this history. There's a theory in like the early days of the left where LaSalle had this theory called the iron law of wages, which was uh, rather similar to this, although not exactly, but his idea was that because workers needed to reproduce themselves, um, which in normal people talk means paying your rent and uh, purchasing food and providing for your family and just reproducing your current quality of life, maintaining um, you know, uh, uh, your, your, your current material status. It's because they need to reproduce themselves. Um, wages could never fall below the reproductive cost, your day-to-day, month-to-month cost. Um, because otherwise, people would necessarily drop out of the workforce, and um, that was, uh, you know, supposed to be this iron law of this theory of, uh, you know, how the political economy functioned under capitalism. We believe a market sets wages as a function of the marginal productivity of the worker. Bro, I don't know. I I see all sorts of totally overpaid, unqualified fucking morons, and then I see a whole bunch of talented people who are my, myself, for example, <laughs> talented people who are severely underpaid. Um, I'm. Are you talking? So here's the question: 
are they talking about this in the totality of 300 years that this thing, let's say, let's is the most generous interpretation I can give, that there's like a sine curve, right? There's like a, there's ups and downs, there's peaks and valleys, and there are periods where this is more or less true and it can go out of sync, it can go out of alignment. But over the course of 300 years, they're arguing that markets will set wages as a function of the marginal productivity of the worker, whatever. Um, and if that happens to be the case, I would have to say that we are in an extreme, we are in like the lowest valley of that process because that just does not seem to track to reality right now. Um, I mean, I, I know people who work at Google and get paid enormous amounts of money for doing fucking nothing. And then there's people who do like an incredible amount of work and are totally exploited and underpaid. Um, yeah, he says, therefore, technology, which raises productivity, drives wages up, not down. I mean, the threat of automation drives wages down. It makes people I mean, he's actually he's within all of this has never accounted for the potential for people to organize as a source that drives wages up. Maybe it's just an ideological omission, but like wages don't like magically go up on their own without people organizing. I mean, there's there's cases in which competition can do that, but um, that is, I, 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 I hate to inform you, um, that has not really been the case for most of the development of the world. This is perhaps the most counterintuitive idea in all of economics. Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, look what happened to the horses, but it's true, and we have 300 years of history to prove it. I would like to see the 300 years of history and for them to... Uh, expand on that argument. Um, I picked up this story from Josh Klein, the uh, the artist. I'm sure some people are familiar with his work. He just had the two floor um, show at the the Whitney that was up this summer. Best show that I've seen in uh, a decade. You know, it's it's really um, it's really incredible. He told me this story about the horses on the West Coast, and I'm going to um, forget some of the numbers attached to this, but in advance of the Model T automobile, there is something like a quarter million horses on the West Coast, and then within the next 50 years after the automobile is invented, the population of horses declines to be about 20,000 or 25,000 or whatever. Um, and so uh, some people... Some people make the argument that, you know, what automation and the, um, you know, uh, incredible increase of technology is going to do is uh, treat our workforce similar, our human workforce similar to the disposable horses around the, uh, around the advent of the Model T. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of feel like, I don't know, uh, I can see, I'll get, I'll, sorry, I'll, I'll wrap this up in a moment, but I can kind of see that, like, Certainly AI is driving down the wages in journalism. Is it, where is it driving the wages up? You know, give us, okay, give me, I'm not going to believe it unless I see the 300 years of history. You got to explain that to me. You can't just say that you have it and not show the evidence. I'll leave it at that. We believe in Milton Friedman's observation that human wants and needs are infinite. I agree with that as well. Uh, you can agree with that as a socialist, and you can also agree with a whole bunch of other stuff that Milton Friedman wrote about, uh, and David Schweikart will give you the better argument than Friedman on all of those things. We believe markets also increase societal well-being by generating work in which people can productively engage. We believe a universal basic income would turn people into zoo animals to be farmed by the state? <laughs> I was not, I was not expecting that. <laughs> I mean, I thought that he was like strategically throwing a few things out there. He's like, um, oh yeah, you know, social welfare programs and national defense. I'm not just a total, you know, lunatic C-setter and cap person, but <laughs> like UBI is going to turn people into zoo animals to be farmed by the state. What's that meme where it's like the uh, the the milk boy farms or whatever? What well, I I forget the fucking meme. It's like someone will find it in the chat. Uh, man was not meant to be farmed. Man was meant to be useful, to be productive, to be proud. Bull milking. Thank you. God damn it. Flip is listening while running dungeons. Hell yeah. I'm stoked for uh, for Sunday. I guess next Sunday. Do some uh, season of discovery. We believe technological change, far from reducing the need for human work, increases it by broadening the scope of what humans can productively do. 
We believe that since human wants and needs are infinite, economic de demand is infinite, and job growth can continue forever. Why don't we have full? Imp what are you? What are you talking about, man? Like what? Automation is going to disemploy people. I don't think they're going to go to other jobs. Like I just, we. Whatever. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm getting. I'm getting too uh, caught up in this. Let's finish the paragraph. We'll move on to our to our other content. We believe markets are generative, not exploitative. Positive sum, not zero sum. Participants in markets build on one another's work and output. James Karst describes finite games and infinite games. Finite games have an end when one person wins and another person loses. Infinite games never end as players collaborate to discover what's possible in the game. Markets are the ultimate infinite game. Okay. The techno capital machine is the next section. Um, do they have the list of people here? This is an insane list of like, Oh yeah, by the way, all of these people are techno optimists. <laughs> Andy Warhol, Adam Smith. There's a few interesting names in here. Um, we got Hayek down there, Bastiat, John Galt. I'm pretty sure this is the fictional character from the a Ayn Rand novel. Um, Mises, again, we mentioned before, Milton Friedman, Ray Kurzweil, interesting mention. Wait, where is he? There he is, <laughs> Nick Land. <laughs> Yeah, that's a techno optimist. That's a real optimistic guy. Um, <laughs> bro, what are you what are you talking about? It's it's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. Um, and then of course they tag like the Twitter people here. Uh, okay, so we're gonna continue working our way through this piece, but that is about enough for me. Technological Superman. Holy shit. All right, all right. Energy. This is a long piece. I'm going to be honest, I do not want to read all of this. <laughs> I have had, I think I got the gist, the gist of it. Um, I would like to read actually the, um, the Vitalik piece on this. How are we for time? 8.30? Uh, let's see. Let's see if we can do this video. I'm going to try and keep us on track tonight. Um, I believe this comes from... <laughs> yeah, it's it's Nick Land, uh, Earth Crisis hoodie. It's uh, <laughs> it was a Nick Land acknowledgement. That's uh, that's what's going on in that piece. So this was linked. Um, I'll give a brief introduction to this. This is a uh, content creator called Ugopnik, which we looked at a few years ago um, in our massive survey of all the BreadTube channels, all of left wing YouTube. And at that time, Ugopnik was like, I don't know, like. 10 10k subscribers or whatever and we immediately flagged it as like oh this is an interesting channel this guy has a good perspective the videos are well made and, and whatever and now Ugopnik is apparently verified i guess you can get verified on youtube uh 195k subscribers i mean still a small challenge uh still a small channel but you know, uh, uh, quite tremendous growth within that time. And this was linked by Dami Squad, I believe, in the Discord. And um, it's on the longer side. Maybe we have to break this in half. I don't know how much commentary is gonna we're going to need for this. But uh, let's just see what he has to say about the state of this process. I mean, I kind of think that um, the theoretical kind of underpinnings of this idea of like moving people through algorithmic recommendations and whatever... Um, Web 2 in society seems to be falling apart more quickly than um, you can politically educate people by, you know, intentionally upstreaming the algorithm and whatever else. So let's just catch up on some of this space and let's see what Ugopnik has to say. Hassan Abi, more like Hassan a billionaire. Second thought, more like second tank. Thoughts on this guy being a tanky? I, I, I hope he fucking drives a tank to your house, okay? Contra points, more like pro status quo points. Who is a dirty lib, godforsaken tanky, or the worst of them all, a dirty shill? These eternal callouts thrown around in the gladiatorial arena, which is online left wing propaganda, or as us kids call it, left wing YouTube content, have left so many confused on who the hell they should even listen to. 
But before we begin answering that question, what even is a left YouTube, breadtube, the swallowitariat, or whatever you want to call it? Depending on who you ask, they will give you... I would say, sorry to talk over this, I'm going to close out some of these tabs because it's uh, bothering me in the, the browser above, but like the very idea of calling it um, breadtube, like um, Kropotkin, the conquest of bread, was like already a 20th century LARP that is just so r ridiculous. Um, it was a bad name from the beginning. The politics were not scalable and irrelevant. Um, that should have been the first indication. And then I'll shut up. I'll shut up. I will. I'm going to make, I'm going to take a new oath where I'm going to not make fun of anarchists for 10 minutes. Okay. 8.35. So until... 845. Different definitions. But as an unwilling member of this so-called community, and to avoid infighting before this video even starts, let me give you a definition which we'll use as a baseline for this entire conversation. They're simply a loose cluster of channels advocating progressive ideas based on culture, race, and most importantly, class characterized by infighting and a constant disagreement on what is to be done. Noah Samson had made a fantastic guide to the basics of leftists on YouTube. Go ahead and check out his work, especially if you're still confused about what any of these words coming out of my mouth even mean. Good. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get to what we're actually here for. Me telling you which channels are good and which you should avoid like the plague because of my very specific niche political disagreements with them. <laughs> ah, no, what, what are you telling me? Hundreds of those have already been made. So now I can't just score easy YouTube infighting algorithm points by calling other channels stupid and wrong. Well, shit, I, I really want to do a video on this eclectic group of annoying and petty, but also funny, passionate, creative and smart creators who are in it for a better world for themselves and most commonly for both. So instead of looking at them individually, let's look at this left tube pipeline in general by exploring how it works. If it works, is it cringe? Is it not? And most importantly, Importantly, what can be done to maybe, I don't know, improve it? A funnel or a pipeline, as it's more commonly known in this context, is not much more than marketing terminology. When you want to sell a product or a service to people who don't know anything about your business, you need to put them through a few steps before this they're from ready two to weeks buy. Ago, just All to these clear. steps combined are simply not called the a funnel. Manifesto. At first, you need oh, to yeah. inform them about the existence of your product, then tell them how it can solve some of their problems, give them some data on how it helped others in the past, some stats about how it works, and finally, a deal you're willing to propose. Political funnels work in a very similar manner, albeit a bit more complicated, because you see, these different steps in a business funnel are managed by a tight group of professionals, while political ones are managed by a wide range of disconnected individuals and organizations from all over the world. Instead of selling a product, they're pitching an idea. Instead of leading you to a sale, they're leading you to, in this case of the left, uh, an elevated class-conscious perception of the world, while hopefully entertaining you in the process. Now, while this funnel is much bigger than a bunch of people on YouTube or Twitch, it would be foolish to ignore a little thing called the, the internet, hence why we'll concentrate on just that, specifically the big red button website, YouTube. The current lack of organization and structure among these free-floating radicals simply leads all of them to naturally kind of fall into different parts of the funnel. Some contribute to people going down the pipeline, while others, uh, well, not so much. And this is exactly what I would like to explore with you today. Building a grander schematic while using examples of what this funnel looks like now, how different creators impact it, but also more importantly, how with a simple shift, we could be far more productive while also doing what we love, making a living off of internet shitposting. <laughs> Look at this graph!
First, I had to define the goal of this left-wing funnel. For right-wing funnels, it would be making people blame all their ills on everything except the capitalist system, be that minority groups, gay frogs, vaccines, or lizards. An example of such a right-wing funnel would be, you know, hooking them with uh, messed up transphobic propaganda. Then you spoon feed them a bit of xenophobia and you top that off with some heavier conspiracies once they're deep enough in the rabbit hole and you've done it. Perfect drones. For the left, the end point of any online funnel, when you bring it back to the basics, would be getting people to actually apply their beliefs in the real world. Do shit, organize, unionize, protest, and other things I cannot say if I want to keep this video up on YouTube. Oh boy. <laughs> so, okay, I think this is a wide enough fair goal, which doesn't get too entangled with whatever Marxism, Leninism, anarcho-feminist, judo-bolshevik, democratic POC, cracker, liberal, communist school of thought you all belong there we to. Go. Now we're talking. The funnel should build socialists and anarchists who act on their ideas, because without that, this whole thing is just a circle jerk. So, this is what I came up with. All right, let's see what he's got. Okay, we got a giant um, graph. Yeah, not the prettiest thing, but let me walk you through it. Each layer has multiple types of creators. These types are pretty... Is this black red guard in the teachers? Is that okay? Let's let let's let him go through it. Be simplistic, and most of these people fit multiple categories and even funnels. But I have yes? to stop somewhere me? in the name of your and my own ever deteriorating attention spam. Many of the people on this list will likely not identify with the position I'm giving them, either because of humility by saying shit like, well, we just make entertainment, or that they're small-headed dum-dums that uh, you shouldn't listen to while managing to yeah, deliver brilliant insight res, time actually. and time again. And the most important category of people on this list who will not like being no. identified with their label Let's are, see if I can find well, it. Uh, I, I call them tumors, my man. And funny enough, this is the only category that permeates all the layers of the funnel. But you know what else permeates my existence as a proud second worlder? No access to most of the good shows and movies I want to consume with my every fiber, only because some corporate executive decided they should be available in my region three months after release. This is where Atlas VPN comes into play. Just one click and the likes of Netflix or Apple TV start thinking I'm some Californian stuck in traffic or a Brit enjoying a succulent Chinese meal, and voila, I get to watch whatever I want. But the power of Atlas VPN doesn't stop there. It can help you truly keep your Google searches in private. It stops malicious links and annoying okay, ads the, uh, and tells you when someone doing is trying the ad, to steal your data. Doing the ad, I'm going to mute it for a second. This is the highest res I could find, which still isn't super high res. I'm pretty sure that's the icon for Black Red Guard. Um, Hakeem in here, Richard Wolf. Do I recognize all of these channels? Uh... Pro, is this prolet cult in here? Um, these are the teachers. That would seem to be the most important section of the people who like prepare you for, you know, give you the education for political action. Revolutionary left radio, Trunon, Chapo Trap House. I can't read some of this. These all look vaguely familiar. Hassan. Um, what else really sticks out? The Jokers. <laughs> who are the Jokers? Philosophy 2, Mia Mulder, Sean Jen. Oh, multiple people are, some of them are listed twice. Hakeem is up here, Sean Jen, uh, Sun. Oh, I forget, I forget this account. We, uh, we looked into this. I think we looked into it the day that the channel got demonetized. The name is eluding me now. Um, Amy Goodman, Democracy Now!, <laughs> Novara Media. Is this Mexi up here? I mean, we spent a long time looking through all of these different, um, all right, sorry, I talked over the video for too long. Going back, the ad is now over. Anyone who puts Black Red Guard as the, Black Red Guard is like, I don't think people watch that seriously. I think they, like, they, it's almost like people watch it to make fun of him because the guy's crazy. It's not like a serious political discourse. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's see, let's see. <laughs> 
You see, everyone's journey down the funnel, while well, generally within certain parameters, can go very differently. For some it takes decades, while others get a matching Mao and Lenin tattoo 10 minutes after they date their first communist. Hell, some never even make it down the funnel and remain liberals at best or whatever ideology your uncle has at worst. Why this happens, both through the online and other political or sales funnels, is incalculably wide and diverse. We all come from different worlds, different realities, ideologies, call them whatever you want. And it's obvious that one method cannot work for everyone, no matter how much you've been taught to hate or love your boss in the first place. So, then, in the funnel, who exactly are the so-called tumors? I didn't name them that out of spite, but because they simply do operate like tumors, swelling, growing, swelling, and growing, no other reason to exist. The tumors refuse to participate Bosch? in said funnel, and instead they become Bosch channels, writers, content creators, and so on, whose entire purpose is mostly growing their Mr. own Beast. image, brand, and audience. Well, there's nothing wrong in trying to grow your shit. The only reason you end up in this category is if you grow it at the expense off the funnel. You see, the problem with pushing people down the funnel for them is that their content stops being engaging for people who've actually moved further down, who managed to, for the lack of a better word, outgrow them. People moving down the funnel means less views, listens, or streams. Less views, listens, or streams means less money, popularity, and relevancy. So sometimes subconsciously and other times with very real strategy and intent in mind, tumors shit talk and smear other creators from the funnels below them. They often camouflage that as being principled, fighting against problematic schools of thought or my favorite purity checking. Instead, most of the time, it's simple drama and content baiting. <laughs> These are mostly debate bro channels and streamers, often liberal <sighs> elements bro, of RP class YouTube consciousness in the beginning, but as time goes like, by, show no real signs of give us the any even slightly radical political thought. The both-siders, the lib apologists, the ones who spend I'm five hours shit talking he, like, past socialist experiments something. and then tell you to vote because Biden is the best we've got. The constant conflict pro yeah, behavior it, and totally embarrassing lack of self-awareness. But also, on the other spectrum, there are the elitist theory academics and campists who completely miss that little point of philosophers changing the world, not just being the most right. And while disagreements are bound to happen wherever there are two dudes and a cup half full, it's only when friendly fire becomes pretty much your most successful method of growing your online presence that you become the tumor. Yeah, it doesn't matter if they see themselves the as such or if you like them or hate their guts. Hell, I'm even going to go so far as not to ascribe them as necessarily bad or intentionally malignant. Probably half of them are doing what in their ideological sense seems right. But when it comes to what we're talking about here, the online left-wing political funnel, they are unfortunately not one of those harmless tumors. They keep people from advancing ideologically. They provide fuel for even greater than usual in fighting. They dilute the He's movement and most Bosch, importantly, right? they loot ideological growth into a simple childish game of I'm right, no, I'm right, no, I'm right. Criticism should of course be shared amongst people Name the on the people. same team, but in one-to-one -one conversations, not through loudspeakers. It's just impractical unless all I'm you want to do is throw your YouTube We don't all have to icon. agree and realistically can only guess what school of thought might end up being the one who's right in the I end. Don't see as if we don't see it. Vosh and Keffels. And it's exactly in accepting this modesty of uncertainty I would that believe we should that. treat I don't know others much about in the Keffels, funnel with but... all due respect. Who in the fuck says we are the ones who got it all figured out? All you can do is push your ideas and let others push theirs in this wide, beautiful, ideological family of ours. Don't operate like a dirty capitalist market. History will show what will is, work is this or still won't. The funnel it's on here? us to push people to action and not just petty Tumors, stupid infighting. Is... And the best part is that it's a total myth that by pushing people oh, down so the I funnel, you will lose thing. an audience. Look at plenty of creators ranging from second thought philosophy to Borja Hassan who dedicate the their funnel. time to informing, entertaining, and teaching at a relative the entry level and yet manage teachers. to keep some of the biggest audiences on here without living off of cannibalizing other left adjacent channels they might not fully agree with. But okay, we've spent enough time on these tumors. Disagreements will exist, but the funnel takes precedence. Blah, 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 blah. We should all get along. You got me should run for the Miss World pageant. Yeah, you all get it. Originally, I was going to actually show you the creators I would consider the tumor category, but I decided against it out of naivety or hope that they might eventually step out of this role. They might Sorry, not even be realizing share this the URL. We're still on the same side, I, I think. Anyways, now let's actually take a peek into the meat of this chunky ass funnel of ours. 
We all start from somewhere. Our initial trigger to changing our mind can be anything from personal experience to watching a dude we follow get dunked on in a YouTube video. There's no right, no wrong approach, and that's exactly why this section of the funnel is so important, and not to forget, kind of fun. Let's start from the reply guys. Their lore takes us back to the anti-SJW era, a dark and sweaty time which gave birth to many variants of the Ben Shapiro virus. This virus would seemingly attach itself to unsuspecting videos of progressive feminists or 18-year-old college kids saying something only to be completely obliterated by the superior minds of facts and logic. Well, until people started actually questioning those facts and logics, giving birth to left- Oh my god, Kyle Kalinske is so young. The reply guys. This can be done in many formats, through long-form essays like those of H. Bomber guy. Just one small problem. Sell their houses to who, Ben? Fucking Aquaman! Or Big Joel, or direct analytical dunks like from the Cavernacle. Edgy punches like with bad impenitence. Didn't H Bomber guy do a whole video about how like soy doesn't has have estrogen in it? Just like some like really just like dumb lib nonsense, you know, like absolutely just taking the bait. Whatever the right wingers say is is wrong because because estrogen is good for you. Um, I think we got to go through this a little bit more quickly here. Can music we, or like... art in general, and show us the underlining ideology of the whole thing. Let's skip why to we some relate of the, so the much and why here. we hated it. What message was it trying to put across? Why some of it is propaganda or why? It's... Give us the meat. This is too much. Um... Outside of their homes, but now also schools forward. and friend groups. That's where streamers who treat their role responsibly come into play. From the likes of Hassan, who's basically a one-man Gen Z leftist CNN at this point, or the many different stripes of leftists from Mike from PA, the Serfs, Central Committee, No Justice MTG, Rob Ross at TRRS. By often unwillingly playing the role of either role model or main source of the correct takes, streamers, when not embracing the tumor path, will continue to grow into some of the most influential people of our era. Like it or not. Next on, we have the Jokers. They either tell us we live in a society or make us laugh. They make up the meat of the meat, the largest chunk of the entertainment funnel. Some of them you call comedians, others video essayists and commentators. I cut them into two subtypes. Edgelord internet humor, the likes of Wow Mao, who apparently yes is an actual leftist. Juche co-op gang, a very tall Bart. Aim on animation, which still haunts me in my dreams to this day. But then pretty much the things just become like land creatures. And the OG who was here before it was even a thing, Batko, and many, many other Oh shit, Batko. And the second subtype, Whoa. the long form Deep jokers cut. who make pretty much everything from essays to short documentaries, like one of my personal favorites, the two insane boyfriends over at Boy Boy, the brilliant Mia Mulder, spooky scary socialist with his whole two videos, Sean the Talking Skull, a meme cat who by the way almost drinks as much as me, which is very comforting to say the least. Anyways, a recent rising star, GDF, Philosophy Tube, Balkan Odyssey, and many, many others. By phrasing their content as more generally educational, historical, or as cultural analysis or whatever not so scary term, they manage to pique the interest of people just browsing the web looking for a good laugh or to satisfy their curiosity on this topic or another. They're the shit YouTube will actually recommend. The shit that changes your worldview without you even noticing it. King content, baby. King content. Now, next. Podcasters. I mean, do I have to say anything here? It's it's podcasts. Radio Kill the TV Star. If you're going to spend your time listening to something while you're driving, cooking, working out, pushing out those dark thoughts of cosmic insignificance as you fantasize of the warm embrace of non-existence, wrapping you in its arms after the excruciating experience what? of being given life without having ever asked for it, or cleaning, redecorating, or gaming, podcasts are a constant. I have personally learned a lot from... Just, it's, uh, I have to say that if you're listening to my podcast and you are doing dishes or your laundry or vacuuming, you, I expect everyone who listens to my guy goddamn podcast to sit in a quiet room solely focused on the sound of the voices that is the only acceptable way to listen to it every moment is very significant and important you should not be distracted <laughs> listen twice if you have to play it at half speed or whatever and just sit in silence concentrating on those words <laughs> sit and take notes yeah yeah don't don't vacuum don't do your dishes incredible shows like Chapo Trap House for the humor and interesting takes on theory true anon to grow my hatred of pedo capitalism revolutionary left radio and guerrilla history pod for my praxis and history or blowback for their incredible storytelling oh also a little podcast called The Program that yours truly runs with Hakim and second thought link below but yeah contrary to the news feed the left has managed to find its place in this medium with some oh, of the most this? grassroots financially backed pods out there. Be ones with Hakim and second. The D program. This is the clip that's going around um, that had like that, that terrible clip about um, Israeli civilians, right? That I keep, I keep seeing that reposted. Um, I forget the full context around it. I guess the D program, this is relatively new. Let's just pull this up in a, um, the D it's been a while. I mean, we went over this in like 2020, so it's been, it's been a long time since we looked into this space. 
how new is this podcast? Because I didn't, uh, I didn't clock it as having even existed back then. Where do we see the first video? I thought they had like about to see what's their what's their oldest seven months ago. Where are we seeing here? Okay, um, one year ago. Okay, so it's relatively more recent. Episode sixteen. Maybe they're uploaded out of order. Episode one, whatever. So it's a it's a year old. That's why uh, we weren't aware of it before. Thought link below, but yeah, contrary to the news sphere, the left has managed to find its place in this medium with some of the most grassroots financially backed pods out there being the very ones which are working towards the good old cause. The entertainer step of the funnel in general is pretty exclusive to the internet. Grassroots organization is too busy feeding and housing people to also give them a laugh. It's also the perfect stepping stone one can take because let's be honest, it's mostly not that heavy. None of us can bear to sit through books and documentaries and heavy handed videos all the time, especially when we're not really that involved with a thing in the first place, which people at this stage of the funnel really aren't. And that's exactly what our darling entertainers managed to do. Bridge that gap between a slight interest and real passion by totally normalizing a school of thought that should have been the standard in the first place. The right might have war movies, billionaire funding and countless grifters, but they will always be, well, boring. You've opened up your mind to it. All those years of indoctrination have finally been flushed out along with your daily intake of cigarettes and vodka. You've had an ideological enema and are now finally ready to learn. So just like in IRL, there's nothing you can't do without the right hype man. This section of the funnel, as I've just said, is there to actually show you what why the current status quo really isn't doing it for you. Something happened in your life, or you spent enough time around leftist ideas, and it triggered your need to learn more. But it's not like you'll actually sit through difficult to understand theory and ideas, and you're still skeptical of the concept that there might be actual alternatives to the current system. It's not that bad, you know? And that's exactly where these hype man channels come into play. They, while on the surface having been cut into different categories, really only have one role. Touch on particular people's particular pain points and explain why, very truthfully, they're directly or indirectly systematic and therefore fixable. How capitalism hurts you is somewhat of my channel's specialty, focusing on how you're screwed over financially, emotionally, in spirit and soul. How your boss twists modesty on you as some sort of virtue while siphoning almost all the money you generate for himself. How your inability to find true community or love is stifled by the ever-growing commodification of all relationships, including the family. How dreams which would have been considered modest in the middle of the last century are now borderline impossible for you to achieve, and so on and so on and so on. Channels like my dear friend JT over at Second Thought, who introduces his viewers to a more material understanding of how things really work in capitalism, just to be just to be a little bit of a dick about this the uh you know dreams that could have been achieved you know a half century ago that now seem ridiculous um a half century ago it was still capitalism um it was just new deal liberalism it was social democracy or whatever but it's not like we were living in socialism in the 1970s or 80s um i'm just feeling a little bit i don't know <clears throat> I guess my enthusiasm for a lot of these channels has uh, waned in the last few years. Um, you know, not to mention I've written about this extensively before, all of the other problems of like no real meaningful left wing organization that is for and of the working class. And, you know, all, all of these things that we've talked about uh, <laughs> to death uh, <laughs> over the last few years. But um, I, I don't know. I, I kind of want to. We're almost through this. I'll let him finish because what I'm really interested to see is the teachers, because if he is going to say that, like, what we need to organize is some type of, like, Marxist Leninist revolution, and that is his idea of, like, what the pipeline is supposed to lead to, like, what is the what is the end point? What is the trajectory of this project? Um Maybe we should have just skipped forward to that, but I'll let him go for the next like, you know, minute and a half of this video. But I, I want to see what the proposal actually is, you know, absent the hype and the YouTube content and, and whatever. I understand you have to acculturate people to ideas. You have to have a time for political education, whatever. But if that political education is um, going to lead us to doing like, you know, some Kropotkin LARP from, you know, a hundred years ago, um, I'm going to I'm going to be a skeptic about that. Through the brilliantly written and produced videos, one dime's crazy insight into the economy ideology in the future. I'm learning economics is I'm learning of economics niche, but incredibly important topics like the ones covered by the likes of Catherine or Andrewism 
history deep dives by Freda, history civilis, or the brilliantly passionate Lady Izdihar. How we're impacting our very own planet, explained by channels like Our Changing Climate, as well as fantastic anti-fascist cultural and social commentators like FD Signifier, Best D Marx, Luna Oi, uh, Cock Philosophy, Non-Compete, or John the Duncan, and many, 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 many others. The hype men are the breaking point, the closest to an actual PR team of the online left pipeline. They're supposed to be direct, honest, clear, and if possible, just a little bit entertaining. This is where the marketing of ideas kind of stops. For the only people moving to the next step are those looking for solutions of the problems defined and explained in this section of the funnel. People who finally understand that this shit makes no sense and ask the scariest question. What is to be done? This whole class is going to be It is going to be Marx. <laughs> they're going to be MLs. <laughs> The teachers represent the free online universities of modern ideological education. Just like professors in any college I can think of, most of them often disagree among themselves in most key issues. But with oh, the students coming from all walks of life and incredibly eclectic material conditions, it's this very diversity of teachers the online left has that can be its strength. The teachers outline the many schools of thought of our relatively young tradition from the Marxists to the Kropotkins and the Luxembourgs and Lenins. They go in depth about how the current system functions, how it informs history, what had predated it, what alternatives to it exist, how they may be brought about, what the relationship is between man and labor, man and the material world, man and purpose. By teaching they are fulfilling the very ideals set out to them by the oldest minds of these philosophies, changing the world. Their job is to give the tools needed to generations of self-conscious individuals, to build not only progressive minds who believe, but hands which act. Together with the obviously far more important uh, knowledge one gains from actual IRL organizing, these teachers, just like a mama bird, help chew through the heavy, often boring, long, and insanely complicated history and philosophy, and carefully drop it into all of our hungry, angry mouths. Spit that pure ideology into my mouth, mommy. Am Ew. I right? Oh, Jesus, why did I keep this in the script? Where was it? Yeah, the teachers. Uh, their job never really ends, even if they get someone to move on from the funnel, because as they say, the more you know, the more you know, you know nothing. So, who are they? Well, some of my favorite and most impactful channels of this finishing line of Here ours are go. people like my Here dear brother go. Hakim, who somehow takes the Alexandrian there library he has in his head and gives us what we need to know. Theory channels like Marxism Today, The Marxist Project, Pro Cult, Epoch Philosophy, Zoe Baker for the Anarchist, or The Finnish Bolshevik for the MLs, Jonas Jacob from Cuck Philosophy for those in between, and probably plenty others. Hell, I'll probably get into so much trouble for even putting them all on one list, but that's Papa Yugopnik's burden to bear. I might like some of my kids more than the others, but I'll never, ever tell them. The teachers are here to help learn and wave as the new generations of terminally online humanoids slowly creep out and touch the grass. Oh boy. No matter how much shit they get or we get, I've always... Yeah, yeah, all right. Well, we've gone through, we've gone through the different tiers. Um, I kind of feel like... It's important to remember, I've said this before, but I guess I just, I have to continue reminding myself. Um, this stuff is for children, you know? Um, internet, political education, people who are going to watch YouTube videos instead of reading. Um, it's literally for children. This was like the point of all of the work that I published, that there were kids, you know, 12, 13 years old that were starting down this pathway to political education through memes and internet content and, and whatever. Uh, and, you know, there is something to be said that, I don't know, uh, common sense social democracy is not going to capture the political imagination of a 13 year old. <laughs> like that's just, that's not going to, that's not going to do it. You know, they need some kind of grand vision, something to be excited about and, you know, to, uh, uh, to capture their hearts and minds and whatever. Um, I mean, the downside of that is that, you know, that people also burn out within a few years and, and whatever. <laughs> my, ch my channel is microscopic. No, we're in a totally different category. We're not in, we're not in, in BreadTube. I don't think anybody in BreadTube is reading the uh, Techno Optimist Manifesto or any of the stuff we get up to over here. Uh, I'm skipping over the ad. I'm just going to let this play in the background for a moment. I kind of wish he would have mentioned some of the tumors uh, in this part that's playing now, but... I I don't know. I feel like all of those YouTube channels, can we bring up just the part where they, they go through all of them? Like, let's just get a sense of the scale of some of this. 241,000 subscribers. Uh, Hakeem, this is the first one. 66k 50k 17 61 50 uh, 75 40 200 and uh, uh 264 okay so you total up all of those people who are subscribed to all of them and let's just say that um 
each of those is a unique individual and there's no overlap, meaning like one person is not subscribed to five out of those six channels or whatever. That is, all of those quantitatively combined is less than the people who voted for Eugene Debs in like, I don't know, when was that? Like 1920 or whatever. Like this is just such an incredibly small segment of the population that I I just, I can't feel like this is a serious proposal, you know? I don't know. I mean, maybe I, maybe I grew up or something, but like, um, you know, I had hopes about the, the Jacobin channel of like, it was shaping consensus, not just among like working class people, but also amongst the commentariat. And there was real inroads to a political campaign, but also a political organization that has socialist roots and whatever. And this just feels a little bit like, not a little bit, this feels like really narrowly, um, you know, uh, uh, concentrated on, on YouTube. I mean, I, whatever, that's the hazard of this kind of stuff. Um, is this a meaningful political or organ, uh, form of education? Black Red Guard is a fucking joke. Like this is not a serious account. Um, people watch it to like, I hate to say this, but it, they, they're like kind of making fun of the guy. Cause he's like a, a weirdo who posts all of his stuff on the internet as a weirdo who posts on the internet. Um, I just, I don't think this is a serious proposal. Maybe Richard Wolf is the closest to any of these things, but you know, it's still the very much removed from any, you know, meaningful real world organization. This is like a niche interest for like internet tankies or whatever. Um, I have to say pretty disappointed with this video. Uh, not just me, but, um, <laughs> I, I don't know. Some of this stuff feels more like, um, the best. Okay. The most charitable thing I can say, and then we're going to start the Vincent Bevins, um, uh, podcast, uh, episode on, on Novara media is that, these um, this process of political education and acculturation to uh, left wing ideas is a very useful um, holding pattern for people who get into the stuff at age 12 and then they've got their whole adult lives ahead of them and they're going to have some kind of like, you know, uh, I'm not opposed to LARP and whatever. I did, I've done all sorts of art projects about LARP. I know it's important, but um yeah, I guess it's possible. People just spend like five years LARPing as an internet tanky or an anarchist or whatever. And then at some point in their life, there's an opportunity to organize in their workplace or join an organization or um, make some kind of like meaningful, impactful decision. Um, yeah. Okay. So if it takes you like six to 10 years to get down the funnel and then you watch enough... Um, I don't know, prolet cult videos. And at some point you like join a union. Like, I just, I don't feel like we're talking about real world politics until you're at the point where like, there are people who are organized in trade unions or organized in their workplace and they don't fucking care about politics. They don't care about Marx or Lenin or any of this stuff. They don't know the history or care about the history. It's just that they are organized in their workplace that is normal. That's a normal aspect of everyday life. And it's not like a weird hobby. Go to the gym. Uh, I don't know. Get into art. Make music. Do some other thing that gives you like a cultural identity other than like having a weird like communist flag in your bio or something. Um yeah, this uh, I'm I'm disappointed. I don't know. I thought this video was going to be like, oh, great. We'll revisit this stuff. It'll be interesting. And I feel just sorely, sorely disappointed. So, um, yeah, yeah. Am I the only one who's reading it this way? I feel like we have all kind of like <laughs> grown a lot in the last few years and seen a deflation of the expectations and hopes for this space. So, yeah, that's uh, that's my read of this. I grabbed um, what was the link? Oh, uh, Colleen asked for the URL of the video here sent that in the chat let me let me pull up speaking of maturation of your political ideas we are resuming this episode of uh the downstream podcast is the name of it what is it called um the title of this episode is the missing revolutions of the 2010s uh ash sarkar is one of the uh the hosts of the Novara Media podcast. I believe she's also one of the co-founders of the organization as well. And the author here, the speaker, is Vincent Bevins, who was recently on the Jacobin podcast, also on the Realignment, the um, conservative, uh, populist-leaning uh, podcast that we've listened to a few times. We listened to the Peter Turchin interview. Uh, yeah, who else? Um, yeah, he's gonna <laughs> he's gonna be bullying the anarchists for me today. Uh, he's the author of. 
what's the name of the book? The um, If We Burn. If We Burn is the name of the book, which is a, kind of a, a, a radical um, radical title. That's uh, it's it's uh, uh, pretty severe. Um, I guess it catches your attention, but uh, the description here reads, if you're just joining us, you didn't catch the intro last week. Uh, the 2010s saw a new era of mass protest from Arab up the Arab Spring uprisings in Tunisia, Egypt, and Syria to Occupy Wall Street, Euromaidan, and Hong Kong's umbrella movement. Many of these movements shared a, quote, horizontalist, horizontalist or leaderless approach, and most of them ended in failure. Vincent Bevins explains, experienced some of these movements up close. Specifically, he was in Brazil during the 20 teens. He uh, spoke about that uh, in depth in the intro version that we watched last week. In his latest book, he tries to explain why the movements of the new left didn't succeed and what lessons we can learn from them. On a future stream, we are going to watch the documentary about um, the weather underground, um, speaking of the new left, but something we'll get to eventually. We are just a few minutes behind schedule here. I would like to finish this tonight, so I will try to keep my commentary brief. And um, I highly recommend, Ben Davis gave a, uh, is reading the book right now, gave a strong recommendation um, uh, to read If We Burn by Vincent Bevins. He did uh, a great talk on uh, True Anon that I also listened to. So yeah, I mean, we've heard this before from... This is one of the foundational ideas behind inventing the future, that quantitatively all of these protests that keep coming out, you know, um, a Iraq war protest, uh, uh, the, uh, Occupy move, the Occupy Wall Street movement, the um, even the pink pussy hats, like every protest that comes out is quantitatively the most people who've ever been on the street, and yet the disorganization, the lack of demands... Um, just results in failure and failure. I think what what they say, so, sorry, dollar bills, because I, I see, I, I recognize your criticism talking about he's an ML. Um, what they say that I think is uh, useful on the True Non podcast is an anti anti Leninism. That's the kind of that's the phrase that they use for it, which is that um, some type of hierarchical organization is necessary to go up against a political opponent that is very hierarchically organized, um, has discipline, and is also moneyed and has resources and whatever. So we don't need to be LARPy Marxist Leninists or you know vanguardist or whatever, but having some level of party discipline such that, for example. Um, one faction of the DSA in, I don't know, in, in Cleveland can call the Oakland faction, uh, you know, red-brown sympathizers or whatever. That type of infighting, there should be a level of rigor and party discipline that um, those that kind of infighting and social media call-out behavior that cripples the movement, embarrasses it, and ultimately undermines it, um, that that needs to stay, like, intra- in, Infra left wing disputes need to stay behind the scenes in the organizations um, because otherwise, like, we're just we're not taken seriously. And, uh, you know, having codes of conduct for what people say publicly, uh, we looked at all of the, uh, the the documentary a few weeks ago where there were people who were the appointed leaders of movements who made shit posts online that could very easily be misinterpreted in the context collapse of the internet. Um, all of that type of stuff. Endless examples of the DSA being basically pressured through social media about like silly clerical errors about miscommunications um, that lead to a total decomposition of the movement. Um, yeah, there's got to be consequences and rules for the organization. Otherwise, this stuff is just it's not serious. You know, it's prefigurative anarchist potluck politics, which is uh, none for me. Thank you. <laughs> OK, I, I talked too much already. Let's watch this video. I'll keep my commentary to a minimum. It's very unexpected. And, you know, looking back on it, one of them said, you know, memorably, you know, all we wanted to do for eight years was cause a popular uprising. And then we did. And it was awful. <laughs> And in this moment where they had to decide what to do, how to change tactics quickly, they, that this the 14 hour meeting does no, no longer does work. Was there a sense amongst this group of like horizontalist anarchists who've been working together for a long time? Did they have an image in their head of what things going well would be? They this is another very interesting um, point that was made to me over these six months where they had planned for every single element of the protests. They had planned down to the day when they were going to take which street, when the likely police repression would come, which newspaper they want to be on the front of on which day. They planned everything down to the minute in their 
in their quest to overturn the bus fare rise. After that, they had planned for nothing. They had the, the day afterwards, they had not thought about it at all. And this is something that people in Egypt <laughs> the told me. The protests in Brazil began out, in reference to bus fare yeah, for context. Good thing. I and all we have myself. to do is kill the king. <laughs> yeah, well, if, you know, I think maybe in like a long time ago that made more sense. Like, you know, when there really was just one bad king and you just needed a new guy to go in there, it was, it was pretty simple. It was pretty simple. But contemporary society, so certainly the like imperfect but real democracy that Brazil had in 2013, it was very difficult to figure out what to do. And so two things happened that are related to the question of horizontalism in practice in Brazil. One, they have perhaps an hour, perhaps six hours to change, to decide how to change tactics to deal with this new situation. They cannot decide. I mean, there are many, many ways that this could go. And they're tired. They're beaten down from organizing, you know, I think sort of heroic battles in the streets that people um, got behind. And they just can't figure out what to do next. They ultimately decide on doing nothing. And then also, because they are rightfully seen as the people that put together this movement that got millions of Brazilians onto the streets for the first time since really the fall of the dictatorship, since at least 1992, thousands of people from around the country try to join their group, but they don't know how to deal with this because in horizontalism, if they were to create a sort of two-tiered structure where like, well, we'll do the 14-hour meetings, but everybody else can just come some of the time. That was called a Leninist deviation by somebody in the, you know, somebody, remember, somebody did block. I remember vanguardism being used yeah. as a very derogatory term. Yeah, somebody blocked. Somebody said that's Leninism uh, because, you know, that was the whole point of the thing was that you can't have two levels. But then also, if you have a group of, you know, 40 to 70 or 80, like dedicated militants that have known each other for eight years, and then you let in a thousand people, well, then now it's just whatever the thousand people think it is. It's no longer the Movimento Passi Libre. It's just whatever these people saw on TV and think that they're joining. Well, that's kind of interesting because in the early chapters of the book, one of the things that you talk about is this relationship between punk and anarchism. Right. And that sure, it sort of pops up because, you know, Malcolm McLaren is like, oh, I want to come up with something sh shocking so yeah. that I can sell my clothes. Yeah. So let's and just like this word, and whatever. And he does communism first and it's too shocking. And so he switches to anarchism. Yeah, it's like well, communism actually means something yeah, in this he, context. He makes so. the New York Dolls communists. And then memorably the New York Dolls, like in one of their like biographies or autobiographies, they say, in the United States, you can be, be gay, you can be a drug addict, you can be a drag queen, you can't be a communist. He had gone too far. And so his next band, Sex Pistols, he makes him anarchist. Well, and so like there's this connection between punk and anarchism and i wonder if maybe this is something that um i don't know resonates for you in in the kind of reportage that you were doing but sometimes when i interact with anarchists i feel that it functions more like a subculture than it does a political movement mm -hmm. and so when there are these anxieties of like but everyone wants to do this now and it's like but you said you believed in popular politics right. and now now it's popular yeah. um there is that feeling of like but i liked it when only me and my friends went to this club yeah. like no you you you're too new your clothes are too mm -hmm. new you're not doing it right well i think there is two things there i think there is the real i mean i think that most anarchists by this point knew about the dangers of the famous the lifestyle anarchism i think is the famous book that you know a lot of anarchists would have known about this particular type of risk and certainly mpl would have been dedicated to avoiding it they did want the working class people of Brazil to get behind them. They did want to cause a popular revolt. They weren't going to be, you know, uh, saying like, no, no, this is our club, uh, you know, stay away. But it was the wrong people that came. And this was the thing that they hadn't thought about um, when privileging the street revolt in the center of Sao Paulo. Because as comes up in many, many other of these cases across the, the mass protest decade, if you're in the center of Sao Paulo, number one, you're not dealing with the working class Brazilians that they wanted to reach initially. So one of the decisions they do make is to go back into the periphery into like sort of what would be the Sao Paulo version of favelas. But because they had been organizing the center of Sao Paulo, who comes in their language would be kind of like petty bourgeois, common sense reactionaries. That's who lives there, number one. And number two- Love me dog, love me missus, a <laughs> pedo, simple as. Or like, yeah, or like, you know, <laughs> let's throw them all out, let's chuck them all out, they're all clowns. And yeah. this is like, they're horrified to see, and this is another like weird slippage that happens in the book. They're a party, they do not, they're like extra, parliament, extra parliamentary. 
They do not have a party. They do not believe, they do not do party politics, but they're not against the existence of parties. They know that the state is there and ultimately they want the state to deliver this, these um, benefits to the Brazilian people. But there's this, there's this weird slippage from being a party to just anti-political in general. And anti-politics really wins the streets. But the other point I was trying to make uh, but before I forgot about it, is that when you have like extended street confrontations with the police, who tends to win is like football ultras. Well, I wanted to ask you about <laughs> this because football ultras pop up throughout the yeah. book. And if you're someone who loves football right. and has occasionally been on the sidelines of football scuff, I was like, ah, the football ultras yeah. here again. So they pop up for you in Ukraine and the uh, Maidan protests, they pop up again in Gezi an Park ultra and here in they this are context? in Sao Paulo. So one, why do football ultras keep popping up yeah. in protest movements? And two, do they play Super out fans. in different ways in different contexts? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, if there's a, this is a, one of the okay. things that you could have never planned for, right? But very strangely, whether or not the particular ultras of the of the clubs that are closest to the capital tend to be left or right wing, all, like ends up really mattering for the outcome of some of these uprisings. So like in Brazil, like the biggest, roughest club in Sao Paulo, Corinthians, is pro Lula, pro democracy. So they're not going to be like a fascist threat. If anything, Hell ultimately, yeah. like fast, Sick. you know, now go to 2022, they cleared the Bolsonaristas off the roads when they tried to organize a coup attempt and shut down the highways. But and then in Turkey, you had Besiktas and mm. Fenerbahce fans that they came to Gezi Park with like the A in the A turned to the anarchist A and the C turned to the hammer and sickle. And they come out like on with a left understanding of Gezi Park in Ukraine. Very famously, many of the people that come to be right sector or the, eventually the battalions fighting in the east of the country are right wing football ultras. They that is they are organized and dedicated to not only fighting the cops after the game, but to a right wing uh, vision for the country. And why do they come up? It's because if you have extended street occupations that involve intermittent clashes with the police, the people that do the best at this are the people <laughs> that have been doing it for the last 10 years, the people that do it every weekend, the people that and the people that are like well organized with like, you know, maybe just like not like a proper mass organization, but, you know, you got like what you could call like a cell of like 10 mates that can like that know how to fight together. And they like rise to the top in many, in many uh, situations. Um, in we need to London learn how to fight. In 20 <laughs> Am I taking the wrong 11, lesson from this? There was a massive street protest on March the 26th. And I was there with my friend and we got kettled. And as we were trying to break out of the kettle, a police officer brought his shield down on my friend's head and right. just like exploded, just blood everywhere. And um, some random anarchos with green and black cross came over and bandaged up my friend's head. And then I was like, I should probably try and work out if you've got concussion or something. Yeah. I don't really know how to do this. So I like dragged him into a side street where we then ran into a load of football hooligans who right. very expertly checked if he had concussion. There you go. He didn't. And then signed the bandage into City Firm. But I mean, I think like coming back to the question huh. of like... Um, wow a movement which is based on confrontations with the police. One of the things which I found is that I thought that I was really big and quite good at fighting. Yeah. Um, don't laugh at me. No. I'm maybe five foot two, but I actually have like no, quite, think, yeah, yeah, quite strong legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very good at kicking. Yes. Um, and I thought I was really good at that until like suddenly you're just getting like thrown around like a rag doll by like, you know, a member of the TSG. Mm -hmm. And then the only people who seem to be good at not getting thrown around are football hooligans. Mm -hmm. And do you think that you know, these street movements and how they play out, particularly with anarchists, is that people who are anarchists tend to have a very romantic notion of violence and maybe an over estimation of their capacity for it. And then it's <laughs> happening and then like, oh shit, I'm actually, I don't have a great capacity for violence at in, all. In the case of Brazil, again, these are the people that were, I think, you know, very like smart. Very delicate so phrasing thought on that. They a lot that. about their, their philosophy of, of struggle. They believed really in direct action and they believed, for example, that, you know, if you wanted to lower the price of transportation or make it ultimately, because their goal was the full decommodification of transportation in Brazil. Their goal, it was like, it's free, fair movement, movement to pass libre. They wanted there to be no costs. So they would block the turnstile so that people couldn't pay. They believed in this kind of, this is a prefigurative idea, like the idea that, well, now for six hours, we're showing the world that like what it could be like to, to, um, to not have to pay. And also the the conflict with like the most visible and violent 